question is that the amendment be disagreed to. The member for Monash. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And this address is actually not only to this parliament, but it is to all of those people listening across Australia that actually listen to the broadcast of parliament. Now, I think there's a whole lot more from my experience. And you listen to these addresses live. Well, there are two addresses today that made a fine contribution to this debate. One was from the Shadow Minister himself, Mr Suka, member for Deakin, and the other from the Opposition Leader of the House, Paul Fletcher. Because they, as government ministers at the time, lived through the processes and the intricate uh, policy statements and the criticism they received as government members for what they put in place in regard to the cashless debit card at that time. And because I was only an observer, why was I an observer? I have great respect for members of this House, senators and members of this House. And each one of them, when they asked me, why do you get on so well with Lou O'Brien? He's a gnat, you know, he's not this, he's not that. But he's a representative of his community. Why do I see the member for Dunkley re-elected? Because she has established herself very tightly with the community of Frankston and surrounds that she represents. I reflect the, the electorate of Monash. I think I do. Cut for toast, white cut for toast, a bit thick. Making a contribution to this debate is more than just consideration of some policy. It's actually about people's lives and how they live them. And the passionate addresses by some in the House and what has what conspired over this last few months after the election of this government has been a real eye-opener for me. And it's been a, a great support for me because what I've always done is listened to the members of parliament that represent their area. And the members of parliament that represent these areas, particularly the former member for Lingiari and the current member for Lingiari, I have great respect for. I don't know the new member very well, but I knew the previous member very, very well. And their commission was to bring the difficulties around Indigenous policy to the House. And before this, the election, I've got, to, I've got to explain myself first in saying this to you. I was not a supporter of bringing in the cashless debit card. I wasn't vocal about it, but I just wasn't a supporter of it. For all the reasons that, of not interfering in people's lives has been my best philosophy that I can live by is to have Australians have equal freedoms in all that they do in all government services and I felt that was a restriction on that. But this is what the communities were asking for. This is what the Member of, of Parliament on my side and the Labor side were asking for and they said this will work and they gave me the reasons that this would work. So I have, to, I have Indigenous communities within my electorate. <coughs> um, I try to address their concerns in everything that I do, but I listen to those that have got a lot of Indigenous people in their communities because they're the ones that are closest to the people. They're the, un they're the ones that know who the, the strong leaders are in their community, Indigenous leaders in their community. And we have heard from both sides of the House stories about strong Indigenous leaders in Sejuna, for instance, as we just heard from the previous speaker. In listening to those people, yet before the election, we had the then opposition, the Labor opposition, 
taken the very moral high ground on this issue and say we will abolish this card on coming to government. And they did. Until their own people came to them and said, we have made a terrible mistake. This is now what's happening in our community since that time. Even though we put into place some hundreds of millions of dollars worth of support services. But quite often, Deputy Speaker, support services are putting ambulances at the bottom of the hill, delivering after the fact of the problem. We don't just do it in Indigenous affairs, we do it in lots of portfolios where we say, because we have this problem, we will put more ambulances at the bottom of the hill, rather than dealing with the issues within community that we need to deal with. So we are not faced with this. To me, the voice is a part of that, but you all know where I stand on that. But what I would put to you, had we have listened to the Indigenous representatives here in this House and in the Senate and what their communities were saying, we wouldn't have got ourselves into the debacle that we now find ourselves. Then this legislation trying to roll back and saying, we'll give it a new name, we'll call it a smart card, but the underlying thrust of the policy is exactly the same. The member for Deakin, the shadow minister, was criticised because he said, what's changed? I, I suppose somebody might think that what has happened in these communities well, it's a change, all right. And as has been described by many members today, that change hasn't been just a little change. That change has been a quite destructive change. In fact, the change has been so great that it has exposed not only those being affected by the alcohol and violence and drugs and stealing and money being ripped off from one another, as was the case beforehand. But it's actually affected the lives of the authorities, the police, the welfare agencies. You've put pr enormous pressure on the services that you have provided as well. And what are you going to do? Have another intervention? And how long, as it's been explained here, even though you've now allied another $150 million just for the process, just for the process to go through to put the new card in place? That's the same as the old card. Different colour. Different colour, different name. And that's going to take quite some time to put in place. And there's been a question mark. Are there enough people left in the services that the government provide to actually implement it? Have they got the expertise to implement it and how long will it take? How much damage is going to be done in those Indigenous communities before the card comes into play? Are there no interim arrangements? Can people not choose very quickly? Can community leaders in given communities say we want our people to stay on the old card? Or is it too late for that? Have they gone? I don't know. No, I, don't. I don't think anybody knows. But what I know is the government's got itself into a terrible pickle and it's trying to put lipstick on the pig, and you can't. Go and ask, go and ask any of the members of this House that have got major Indigenous communities in their electorates. Go and ask them. Go and ask them what they think. Go and ask the member for Grey. Go and ask. 
Mark Coulton. Go and ask what they think. They just might happen to know what they're talking about. Because they deal with the Indigenous leaders in their communities. They know them as friends. And they know them as colleagues in their community. And they work with them. They always have. They're long-serving members. They understand the issues. I know, politicians, you don't understand anything. No, when we try to inflict upon the Australian communities things that we think, we think should be done from here in Canberra, how often does that fall in the hole? How often do you hear somebody say, oh, we've had years of inaction here? No, we haven't. We've been trying with the wrong policies for a long time. We have failed to listen to what Indigenous people say to us. We have failed to listen to what communities say, Indigenous communities say to us. Failed. And the outcome is something that was working quite well, I hear from the members, it's no longer working well. And supported by the community. And supported by the community, all the community, whichever colour they were. Supported by all of them. Look, there's always more to the story. My uncle Keith Skinner <coughs> was the lighthouse, uh, the lighthouse harbour master pilot for Sir Juna Port. My auntie Loris and Keith lived over there after he came off the uh, lighthouse ship Cape York uh, as a deputy uh, mate. He went to Sejuna and he brought all the ships in to the harbour. So I only ha ever had these wonderful stories about this beautiful place, Sejuna. Yet in this parliament today, what do I hear? I hear shocking stories about what's going on in Sejuna. I hear the complaints that are coming to members. I hear the difficulties that the police force is now having all the agencies that support the Indigenous communities are now having. That doesn't paint a beautiful picture of a wonderful city. That doesn't mean you should have guard fences and barbed wire for protection. That doesn't mean people are being exploited for their weaknesses. Goodness, we do that right across Australia. What it does say to me is we've made a mistake and no one's been brave enough to say, yes, we have made a mistake and this is a legislation we're putting in place to fix it. If that were the case, I'd be totally supporting you. We're not opposing this legislation. We're not opposing legislation. But we are making the point that when people with a certain ideology <coughs> and process within the parliament make big commitments in election campaigns without absolutely addressing what the people actually need and want and what a difference it has made in certain communities and what a blessing that's been to a lot of women and children can I just say that again? Women and children who were better off under the old scheme. Does anybody think of that? Because they're real people. They bleed. They could be my kids. They could be your kids. That could be your wife. Could be your sister. Could be your family. And what do the Indigenous people hold most sacredly? Family. So what we can do as a nation for that family is get on with this legislation, recognise we've made a mistake and get this over with as quickly as possible because you may just save one life. I thank the 